She was 16, a family's only daughter, a high school cheerleader. Heather was not afraid of anything. She tried all. Then she was brutally murdered. She'd been shot with some sort of high-powered weapon. The hunt for the killers turned on three friends, including the high school football star. It's pure crazy. Young kids started out having fun and it took a wrong turn. Now you have four wasted lives. For most families, a child's teenage years are often difficult, marked by experimentation, rebellion, the search for one's own identity. 16-year-old Heather Rich was testing her limits and her parents' patience when she snuck out of the house one October night. But what began as an adventure with friends ended in tragedy. On this program, one of those friends will tell American Justice his story of how, for no special reason, three teenagers became killers. In a remote region of southern Oklahoma, just across the Red River from Texas, sits the quiet town of Warica. A tiny community of 2,000 people, Warica has few distractions to offer its residents, especially its teenagers. It's pretty much small town America where kids are growing up. Uh, there's nothing to do. You know, they don't have any, any movie theaters or anything like that, you know. It's just the same old, same old every day. In the fall of 1996, 402 North Ash Street was home to the rich family, Gail, Dwayne, and their four children. The second youngest was 16-year-old Heather, a sophomore and cheerleader at Warica High School. She was just a typical young girl, but there was something always special about her. She could enter a room and all eyes would turn to her. There I am with my towel on. <laughs> she was fun to be around, you know. She's always laughing, cutting up, doing whatever. She always wanted to do something wild and, or just, really she just wanted to, to do something different. Heather was not afraid of anything. She tried all. On the evening of October 2nd, 1996, in a scene familiar to many families, mother and daughter got into an argument over a $300 telephone bill. I was ready for a fight here. Okay, Heather, how are you gonna pay this bill? Well, she's looking at me in all this innocence, and, and I was so frustrated. I told her that night that all she did was cost me money. And I never said anything like that to Heather. The argument had not yet ended when Heather went to say goodnight to her parents. She came into the bedroom, told her daddy she loved him, and he told her he loved her too. And then she made a big production of walking past me to make sure I understood she didn't say that to me. She was upset with me. And she went to her room, and that was, that was the last I saw my daughter. The next morning, October 3rd, Gail found her daughter's bedroom empty. She and her husband went to the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department in Warica to report their daughter missing. When Gail explained the fight over the phone bill, police told them not to panic. Heather was probably angry and would turn up soon. Gail wasn't so sure. I knew my daughter. She wouldn't have done that. He Heather would handle her problems in a different way, not run away from them. Frustrated with the police, Gail and her husband immediately began their own search of the town. Gail started contacting Heather's friends, one of whom was Randy Wood a 17-year-old senior and captain of the Warica Eagles football team. Her daughter had dated Randy briefly a few weeks earlier, and they had remained friends. Their dating, or what the kids call going together, consisted of talking on the telephone for hours at a time, seeing each other at school, and uh, him coming over to the house and watching TV with her. Now Gail phoned Randy to see if he knew where Heather was. I told her I didn't know anything. 
She said, well, if you knew anything, you would tell us, right? And I, I told her, yes, ma'am. And, you know, and she took my word. But Gail says she didn't believe Randy and felt that he was hiding something. He sounded like a robot. There was no emotion in his voice. And when he would repeat his story to me about where he had been and what he'd been doing, who he'd been with, it was word for word each time. It's too perfect. Worried she wasn't getting the full story, Gail went to talk to another friend of Heather's, Josh Bagwell, also a 17-year-old senior at Warica High School. In the well-to-do section of Warica at the Bagwell home, Gail was met by Josh's grandmother, who had been cleaning a trailer in back of the property. She told Gail that Josh wasn't available. She said he needed a time to party the night before, and so she was going to let him sleep that morning, and she wouldn't let me talk to him. So I left, but did notice that she was cleaning the trailer from a party that the kids had had, and I made note of that. With still no sign of Heather, Gail was growing increasingly worried. Hours became days and local and state police joined the search without success. Then on October 10th, one week after the cheerleader's disappearance, police across the Red River in Texas made a grisly discovery. What we were told at the time was that they thought they'd found a human leg floating in Belknap Creek. From the bridge overlooking the creek, Texas authorities spied a body half submerged in the murky water below. Evidence visible on the bridge clearly indicated foul play. You'd definitely tell there had been a murder there. Uh, you could tell by the patterning of the, of the blood and, and it was apparent that someone had covered it up with dirt and, and tried to conceal it. Police struggled to pull the mutilated body from the creek. It looked like there were more than five, six. Ultimately, we learned that there had been nine shotgun blasts to the body. The body was so damaged that no immediate identification could be made. But Montag County Sheriff Chris Hamilton knew that just across the border in Oklahoma, a high school sophomore was missing. Heather was reported having braces. This this female did she reported having a ring which this female did what do you think guys that look anything like her it's kind of hard to tell i know the braces sure does that evening Dwayne rich heather's father identified his daughter from the ring on her finger Dwayne returned home to break the news to his wife i just told him to hurry up to say it I don't remember a lot after that. I went into shock. I remember screaming, beating on everybody that was close enough to me and um, just trying to accept, accept it, that she was dead. She wasn't coming home. The next day, news of Heather's death spread quickly through the town, reaching her friends at school. Football captain Randy Wood remembers that morning well. Somewhere around third hour, I was at the water fountain by the gym. And a friend of mine came up and said, well, they found Heather's body. And uh, everything just stopped. My world stopped, my time stopped, everything just stopped. That day happened to coincide with Warica High's annual homecoming game. Randy was named homecoming king in front of all his friends. It was supposed to be a special moment, but the festivities were the furthest thing from the young man's mind. I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. Some people would call it bittersweet, but I, I would call it, it was bitter. The honor was there, but I wasn't, you know. I was, I, was, I was on that bridge, you know, thinking about what had happened. Randy, it turned out, knew far more than he was telling about the murder. But to discover that secret and to arrive at the truth, investigators would have to untangle the stories of both the high school cheerleader and the football player.
In October 1996, the body of Heather Rich was discovered in a creek bed near the Red River in Texas. The 16-year-old cheerleader had been missing for a week. Now that it was a murder case, Texas police began looking for who killed Heather and why. Their search would lead them into the heart of a small Oklahoma town and to three teenage boys who turned an ordinary night into a family's tragedy. One's a homecoming king. One's a rich, spoiled kid. One's a kid that's a tough off the streets. It's more like something you'd see out of Hollywood than you would in a southern Oklahoma. Texas police began their investigation in Heather Rich's hometown. And the starting point, obviously, is going to be in Warica, where Heather was last known to be on the night of October 2nd. They interviewed Heather's mother, Gail. She told them about her own search for her daughter and the early suspicion she had regarding two of Heather's friends, homecoming king Randy Wood and his friend, fellow senior Josh Bagwell. We were getting the vibes from these two particular boys that they knew something that they weren't telling us. At Warica High School, investigators interviewed several students. Heather's best friend on the cheerleading squad also pointed police in the direction of Randy and Josh. She had heard that Heather had gone to a party the night she disappeared, and she named the people that were involved. She knew Josh Bagwell and Randy Wood very well. The two boys were well known around town. Josh Bagwell was, was considered to be the uh, little rich kid in town, the one who always drove the nicest car. And he was sort of the rich, dark character in town. Randy Wood, on the other hand, came from poverty and lived in Warica with his grandmother. But he had managed to find his niche. Randy Wood was the captain of the football team and a popular kid in the school. I think just his status as the football player and everything else uh, made him that in the school district. Like many Warica teenagers, both Randy and Josh passed their nights driving the back roads, drinking whiskey, and doing drugs. Cocaine, methamphetamines, marijuana, any number of things. At some point during the day, I would do one of all three of them, or more than one. Sometimes I would do all three. Heather Rich had also experimented with alcohol and drugs. Her family didn't know that she had been sneaking out late at night to meet up with Randy and his friends. She would say she would spend the night with somebody else and come downtown. Most people were scared, to, I guess, to defy their parents, especially girls her age, and, that, and she really didn't care, you know. I guess she thought she was good enough where she wouldn't get caught. But Heather Rich did get caught. On September 27, 1996, just five days before her disappearance, Heather and another cheerleader were found drinking on the sidelines of a football game and suspended from school for three days. Confronted by her parents, Heather revealed that she had experimented with drugs. She was crying and she brought in a cigar box and it was full of things to use to smoke marijuana with. We were concerned about the drinking and why, why she was rebelling in this way, doing the things that seemed out of character. I think she had just began to develop an experience on the fringe of that subculture. And I think that in time, Heather would have bounced off of that and gotten her business um, back in order. But she was not given that opportunity. But did high school seniors Josh Bagwell and Randy Wood have anything to do with her murder? Both told police they had spent the night of October 2nd together playing dominoes and drinking in the trailer behind Josh's house. According to Randy, neither boy had seen Heather that night. He's rattling the story out and there's no emotion, there's no having to think about it, it's automatic coming to him. I had wrote down on my notepad, uh, concluding his interview, that I believed he was lying. Despite police suspicions that Randy and Josh were somehow involved in Heather's death, there were still too many pieces missing. 
But the police were beginning to fill them in. The autopsy results were in. They revealed two interesting details. The first was that Heather had been shot nine times. We stood around and scratched our head and wondered why someone would shoot someone nine times. We have police type shotguns and most of them hold eight. Why is she shot nine times? The second detail, the ammunition used in the crime was Winchester double aught buckshot, an unusual and powerful round. Investigators learned that Beaver Hardware, just off Main Street, was the only store in Warica that carried that type of ammunition. A review of store receipts revealed that just before the murder, 20 rounds of buckshot had been purchased by Heather's friend, high school senior Josh Bagwell. The owner also told police that someone else had been with Josh when he made the purchase. The only question then we had was, who was this guy who was with Bagwell? And the investigators involved in, the, in this overall investigation had learned that he had been seen frequently, Bagwell had been seen frequently with another man by the name of Curtis Gamble. Police were already well acquainted with Curtis Gamble. At 19, the young man had several prior arrests and had spent much of his adolescence in juvenile facilities. Curtis had a terrible background, had a violent background. One of the things he used to like to do is drive around and shoot people's dogs out of their front yards and drive off. And he would shoot cattle, horses, just drive around and kill things. On the afternoon of October 23rd, Ranger Lane Aiken paid a visit to the new suspect's home in nearby Terrell, Oklahoma. There he spoke to Curtis's grandmother, Rita Robbins, who revealed something unexpected. When Curtis was a boy, she used to take him fishing over in Texas um, at the Belknap Creek Bridge. And the description she gave took us right back to the Heather Rich murder scene. The pieces were falling into place. The next day, authorities picked up Curtis Gamble and took him to the sheriff's office in Warica, where he agreed to take a polygraph test. He failed. Police then questioned Gamble for more than eight hours. He admitted that he owned a high-powered gun and agreed to hand it over to police. It was a rare firearm, a Mossberg M9 shotgun. We look and it's capable of firing nine rounds knowing that Heather had been shot nine times. With evidence mounting against him, Curtis Gamble broke down and confessed, implicating himself, Randy Wood, and Josh Bagwell in the murder of Heather Rich. Curtis Gamble lays out the whole story, what, what had happened uh, in about a uh, two-page confession that uh, I typed as, as he spoke. On the strength of Curtis's confession, three weeks after Heather Rich disappeared, police arrested Randy and Josh for her kidnap and murder. In custody, Josh refused to give police a statement, but Randy seemed willing to cooperate. At the sheriff's office, police confronted him with Curtis's confession. He said that everything was my idea, that I killed her, that I was one calling shots, and, and that, uh, you know, he was just following my orders. But investigators were convinced that Randy wasn't the shooter, despite Curtis's accusations. Randy didn't add up. Randy still went to school. Randy played football. Uh, Randy wasn't, quote unquote, what we would consider a killer at the time. Police believed that Randy would lead them to the truth about what happened on the bridge the night of October 2nd. And they pressured him to talk. Chris Hamilton told me, said, well, you, you know, this means a death penalty, right? And I said, man, look here, you know, if you want the truth, man, you know, get a pen and paper and write it down, you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what happened. Randy Wood would go on to lay out for police his story of what happened the night Heather Rich was murdered. Up next, we'll hear that story from Wood himself. In October 1996, in Warica, Oklahoma, Investigators arrested teenage friends Randy Wood, 
Curtis Gamble, and Josh Bagwell for the murder of 16-year-old Heather Rich. While Josh had refused to cooperate with police, Curtis and Randy both gave signed confessions. Each accused the other of being the shooter. Though the events of the night of October 2nd can never fully be known, investigators believed Randy's story came closest to the truth. He stuck to pretty much the same story from the night that we took the statement from him that he admitted his involvement. He was polygraphed on that story, he passed. Randy Wood agreed to tell American Justice the same story he told police. He says the evening of October 2nd, 1996, started like so many others, getting together for a night of drinking with friends Curtis Gamble and Josh Bagwell. Curtis and Josh came over and uh, they said, let's go party, you know, we got some whiskey and some beer, let's go. On this night, the boys would be joined by a fourth person, Heather Rich. Though she knew Josh and Randy well, she did not know Curtis. We were supposed to go pick her up at a church across from her house. We got there a little bit early and uh, she wasn't there, but we all kind of snuck up to her window and knocked and she was already gone. We got back to the trailer and she was sitting on the step of the trailer smoking a cigarette. The trailer was parked outside Josh's house. The four teenagers went inside. First, we're just sitting there, we're talking, you know, the radio's playing. Then Josh had gotten some gin. According to Randy, Josh and Heather wanted to be alone. She went to drinking and they went to kissing and me and Curtis agreed to leave while they, you know, done whatever they was going to do. And, you know, we left. Josh and Heather were, were left alone while uh, Curtis and Randy rode the streets, the back roads, still drinking. When they came back, Heather was extremely intoxicated. Randy says that Josh and Heather had had sex and that consequently Heather felt she had betrayed Randy, her former boyfriend. She was telling me she was sorry and this and that and I told her, you know, uh, you don't have to worry about anything, you know, me and you called it quits a long time ago, so, you know, you're not doing wrong by me. And then, you know, she just kind of the she kind of just, just laid down. Heather had apparently consumed so much alcohol that she was close to passing out. The boys, now drunk themselves, then began encouraging one another to take advantage of the semi-conscious girl. I'm not real proud of this, you know. I think the only reason why it entered my mind is because it was, it was there and it was available, you know. I was young and, you know, it's hormones were raging. I was going to have sex with her, but then I decided not to, you know, because she was just passed out. This is a copy of the two statements that he gave us that night. He says, me and Curtis went in to have sex with her. Curtis had sex with her. He claims he didn't. He says he couldn't. It's whether, whether or not you want to believe that or not. According to Randy, Curtis did have sex with Heather, then left her unconscious in the back of the trailer and continued drinking with the others. A short while later, Heather awoke in a panic. Randy says her screams threw Curtis into a frenzy. And that's when he starts flipping out, talking, well, she's going to say I raped her and so on and so forth. That's when he started talking about killing her. She was going to uh, turn him in for rape. Going to turn them in for rape. So they couldn't do that. They couldn't go to jail for rape. So let's just kill her. Randy claims he didn't take Curtis seriously at first. He's a typical hothead or whatever. He's got the macho attitude or whatnot. Uh, so I'm just thinking, yeah, yeah, what, you know, whatever, you know, you, you know, you're just running off the mouth. But Curtis was not joking. According to Randy. He pulled out the Mossberg M9 shotgun he often kept with him. He levels the shotgun at me and says, you're going to get her dressed. Randy and Josh then began to carry out Curtis's demands. The two boys loaded the barely conscious girl into the back of Josh's grandfather's truck. With Josh behind the wheel, the four teenagers drove off in the direction of Curtis's home in Terrell, Oklahoma. I'm thinking maybe we're taking him home. 
and then we're going to drive back, take her home. Well, I'm going home. Josh is going home. But the boys did not go home. At the Red River, Curtis took the wheel and headed over the border with Heather. Curtis makes a decision to take her into Texas to Belknap Creek, where he had been as, as a young man. She's still in an intoxicated stupor, not knowing what's about to happen. He stopped the truck right in the middle of the bridge. And uh, as he's getting out, he grabs a shotgun and, and tells me and Josh, you know, get her out and put her over on the side. On the isolated bridge, Randy says that he feared for his life. And so again, he obeyed Curtis's orders. I knew there was nothing I could do to stop it. Because, you know, he had it set in his mind what he was going to do, and there's not a doubt in my mind he would have killed me too if I would have objected to what he was doing. The boys then pulled Heather's unconscious body from the back seat of the pickup truck. We put her on the ground. Uh, it was on the bridge itself. We put her right there, and she kind of slumped over. I knew that once I set her there, I knew it was all over with. I get back in the truck, and uh, I sat there with my hands covering my face, and then hear one shot, and a lot more come after it. I put my hands on my face because I just I couldn't I couldn't deal with it. Something in me just opened the door, and I stepped out, you know. And I seen the blood, and then, and then I seen the big hole that, was, that used to be her head. He had shot her in the back of the head first, and it was just, just laid it open. Death is, uh, it's got its own face. And, uh, it's, it's unlike anything else. According to Randy Wood's story, after Heather was shot, they all helped throw her body into the river then returned home. No one said anything to police until they were presented with a mountain of evidence against them. Having won confessions from Randy Wood and Curtis Gamble, authorities next turned their attention to the only one who refused to cooperate, Josh Bagwell. In October 1996, Teenagers Josh Bagwell, Curtis Gamble, and Randy Wood were each facing charges in the kidnap and murder of 16-year-old Heather Rich. While the kidnapping had occurred in Oklahoma, the murder itself had taken place just across the border in Texas. It was here that the teenagers would stand trial. All would be tried as adults. Montag County District Attorney Tim Cole initially planned to pursue the death penalty for alleged trigger man Curtis Gamble and life sentences for the others. That was something that the family, Gail and Dwayne Rich and I, uh, all agreed up upon that the th these three individuals all needed to be held responsible for this. But convicting all three young men would not be easy. The weakest of the three cases was the one against Josh Bagwell. Unlike his two friends, Josh had not confessed to any role in Heather's murder. We didn't have strong evidence as to what his participation level was at the scene, so we were going to have to depend upon the, uh, what the other two participants told us. Like the police, Tim Cole had accepted Randy Wood's version of events. I made the decision very early after talking to Randy Wood that he might go along, he might help, but that I didn't think he was the type of person that would pull the trigger. In exchange for Randy's testimony, Cole offered him a life sentence with the possibility of parole in 30 years. Randy quickly accepted the deal. As for Curtis Gamble, the prosecutor believed he was the actual killer. The evidence seemed to point to him. But there was also something else. You could look into his eyes and you, you knew that something was wrong. Uh, you weren't sure what, but it just wasn't right. Um, I've called him evil before. I think he's an evil young man. Still, to make the case against Josh Bagwell as strong as possible, the prosecution wanted to offer Gamble a deal as well. Before the offer was made, prosecutor Tim Cole sat down with Heather Rich's parents. 
He said, will we be willing to let him trade the death penalty in exchange for life in prison? Could we accept that? And we went home. We thought about it for two days. And we came back and we told him, yes, we could. It was more important to us to get Josh than it was to see Curtis be put to death. Curtis agreed to the deal. On October 15th, he pled guilty to the murder of Heather Rich and accepted a life sentence. The essence of the plea agreement was admit you're the shooter, tell the truth, and tell the truth when you were called to testify. We gave him a life sentence and not the death penalty, which is what I fully believe he would have gotten had we continued that trial. True to his reputation, Curtis's violent streak showed during the sentencing hearing. All the bailiff did was put a hand on his back, kind of directing him. Before we could even really react, he's got the bailiff. He's knocked him down, he's got him by the throat, and he's choking him out. I grabbed Curtis around the neck and started trying to, uh, to choke him to the point that he would let go of, of the bailiff. Eventually, Curtis passed out and he let the bailiff go. Four months later, in February 1998, almost a year and a half after Heather's murder, the trial of Josh Bagwell opened in Montag, Texas. Television cameras were only allowed to record the proceedings from outside the courtroom. Josh's defense team, which declined to speak to American justice, came to court with an aggressive, two-pronged strategy. First, they attacked Heather Rich's character. The only term I could think of that would be appropriate is that they trashed her. Uh, they did everything they could to try to get the jury to be less sympathetic towards her. Heather's mother, who testified about the last moments she spent with her daughter, faced the defense's onslaught. We wanted to bring up her drug use and uh, her drinking problems. All of these things are a part of Heather. She was this honor student, this wonderful daughter. And this same daughter that did all of these things was also the one that could drive us crazy because here she was experimenting with marijuana. When it's all said and done, what came down to, she was a teenager. The second prong of the defense attack was to raise sympathy for Josh Bagwell, who, his lawyers insisted, had been forced into a murder plot against his will. But the success of this strategy would depend on the testimony of Bagwell's alleged co-conspirators, Randy Wood and Curtis Campbell. Both were scheduled to appear under plea bargains worked out with the prosecution. Curtis took the stand first and immediately played into the hands of the defense by reverting to his original story. He again insisted that it was Randy who had shot Heather and now included that Josh hadn't even known that she was going to be killed. Prosecutors say they weren't concerned by this reversal. Tim Cole knew how the jury would react to Curtis. I wanted them to see him. I wanted them to see his demeanor. Uh, it didn't really matter to me what he said because I felt that as soon as you see Curtis Gamble, you believe that he is the killer. By changing his story on the stand, Curtis Gamble violated his plea agreement. He would later be convicted of conspiracy to commit murder and was given a second life sentence. Curtis's turnabout made Randy Wood's testimony all the more crucial. But the mere fact of Randy's plea bargain made him a target for the defense. Josh Bagwell's lawyers would be able to hammer him and his testimony because, well, aren't you getting this? Didn't you agree to testify uh, against Josh Bagwell in exchange for, uh, you know, no death sentence? Then on the night before he was due to testify, Randy Wood shocked everyone by suddenly withdrawing from the deal he had made with the prosecution. I thought at that point that meant he was not going to testify and he wasn't going to take the deal. I knew that I had very little chance of convicting Josh Bagwell without that testimony. So at that point in time, I felt like the case was over. It wasn't over. Randy Wood still planned to take the stand. I didn't want people to think that I was just testifying for the plea, for the plea agreement, you know. I wanted people to believe my story. Because without 
you know, if they don't believe it, you know, what good is it anyway? The decision was almost unheard of. By refusing the deal, Randy risked a full capital murder trial for his role in Heather's murder and a possible death sentence if convicted. I've never known a defendant to do what Randy did ever, nor have I ever heard of, of a defendant doing what Randy did. It just hasn't happened, at least not in this part of Texas. His own lawyer was saying, hey, hey guy, this, this is crazy. I mean, it's noble, it's very noble what you're doing, but from a legal standpoint, man, you're crazy to do this. You could wind up on death row. When Randy Wood rejected the plea bargain, there was no telling what kind of impact it would have on Josh Bagwell's fate or his own. No one was more stunned by Randy's course of action than Heather Rich's parents. And that led to a stunning encounter between the accused and the bereaved. February 1998, Montague County, Texas. A turning point in the Heather Rich murder trial. Confessed co-conspirator Randy Wood had stunned the court by withdrawing from his plea agreement the night before he was due to testify. This opened him once again to his own capital murder trial. He was risking being subject to the death penalty again. Because without the deal, then that means that I could have then come back and sought the death penalty against him. Yet Randy insisted this was the course he wanted to take. I owed it to everybody, including myself, but especially her family. I mean, because they, they would have always presumed that I was just saying what I said because of the plea agreement. Everybody would have presumed that. On February 10th, the third day of testimony, Randy took the stand. He testified that Curtis Gamble had shot 16-year-old Heather Rich, and more importantly, that Josh Bagwell had been a full participant in the murder and cover-up. When he went back and got on the stand, rejecting everything, got up there with no protection, we knew that he was telling the truth because of what he was risking, his own self. He was risking being put to death. I knew for sure Randy was telling the truth. The jury believed Randy, too. On February 14th, Josh Bagwell was found guilty of both capital murder and conspiracy to commit murder. He was sentenced to life, plus 99 years in prison. Randy Wood, meanwhile, returned to jail to await his trial. There he made an unusual request. He wanted to meet the parents of the girl he had helped murder a year and a half earlier. They agreed. The event was televised on ABC's Primetime Live in May 1998. I'm sorry I am not well, all this happened. I know you And I wish there was a way I could have changed it and done something different. I finally got to tell them, you know, how I felt, you know, that I was sorry for what happened, and they thanked me for the testimony I gave. I mean, that may have been the turning point even because they believed you. The, the jury, I know, believed you. Yeah. You didn't have to do what you did. I did the right thing. You did. It helped just to be able to talk to Randy to let him know what my feelings were, because I wanted to know, Randy to know that I'd forgiven him. I wanted him to know that, and to be able to look at me and, and to see that there was no hatred in my eyes for him, and he saw it. He knew that. I really don't know what else to say. That's, you've said enough. I appreciate it. Thank you for talking to In August 1998, six months after Josh Bagwell's trial, Randy Wood's own trial began. In a rare expression of concern for a murder defendant,
Prosecutor Tim Cole had appealed to Randy to make a deal. Both I and his attorney um, tried to get him to, to plead guilty before that trial and to accept a deal that would have allowed the judge to sentence him to something less than life. We made that offer to him. There's a bond that's developed between Tim Cole and, and Randy, and he has a certain amount of sympathy for Randy. I mean, obviously, he was the adversary in that situation, but he was trying to tell Randy, you need to listen to what your lawyer says, and you need to, to take this deal. He wouldn't take it. He would not stand up and say that he was guilty of Heather Rich's murder. Randy was making his stand on principle. In his mind, there was a difference between what he had done and what Curtis Gamble had done. Murder is one thing, man, but being scared and, and being a young kid is something totally different, you know I mean? I didn't pull a trigger. I didn't, you know, it, it wasn't my idea to kill her. I mean, I didn't, I didn't do it, you know? To me, murder is a, is a physical taking of somebody's life. I mean, I, I didn't do that. Texas law, however, does not distinguish between an individual who commits a murder and one who is merely a party to the crime. He helped to kidnap her. They crossed the state line. He's one of the ones that carried her and laid her on the bridge and set her up. You know, he was a part of that. So he'll be punished for the rest of his life. On August 27, 1998, after only a three-day trial, Randy Wood was convicted of capital murder. His sentence was automatic, life in prison, with no possibility of parole for 40 years. I really don't feel good that Randy Wood will spend the rest of his life in prison. The problem was that he gave me no choice because he would not plead guilty to anything in her case. Randy will be in prison the rest of his life, but I don't feel like he should be, no. Curtis and Josh, I feel like they should both be dead. But Randy, I feel like, should serve some time in prison. Yes, he, he should. He did something that was terribly wrong, but not to pay for it with the rest of his life, no. At the Texas prison he now calls home, Randy still holds on to the memory of his one-time friend, the girl he helped murder, Heather Rich. I think about her every day, you know, when I wake up, before I go to bed. She's always on my mind, you know. It haunts me. It's just ingrained in my memory because it's undoubtedly the most horrible thing I've ever seen. When we spoke to Randy, he said he didn't believe he would remain in prison until his 57th birthday when he will first be eligible for parole. He holds out hope that he will be released early on appeal. In January 2002, and one final twist to this story, the other two individuals involved, Curtis Gamble and Josh Bagwell, carried out a daring nighttime escape from a Texas jail cell. After a 10-day nationwide manhunt, the two were apprehended without incident and sent back to prison. I'm Bill Curtis. Join me next time for another episode of American Justice. Walk up to another crime scene